Question 2, Part 1 of Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Faith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Faith by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 2 of the Act of Faith in Ten Articles Part 1, Articles 1 through 5 Part 2, Articles 6 through 10 We must now consider the Act of Faith and 1, the Internal Act 2, the external act. Under the first head, there are ten points of inquiry. First, what is to believe, which is the internal act of faith? Second, in how many ways is it expressed? Third, whether it is necessary for salvation to believe in anything above natural reason? Fourth, whether it is necessary to believe those things that are attainable by natural reason. Fifth, whether it is necessary for salvation to believe certain things explicitly. Sixth, whether all are equally bound to explicit faith. Seventh, whether explicit faith in Christ is always necessary for salvation. Eighth, whether it is necessary for salvation to believe in the Trinity explicitly. Ninth, whether the act of faith is meritorious. Tenth, whether human reason diminishes the merit of faith. First article, whether to believe is to think with assent. Objection one. It would seem that to believe is not to think with assent, because the Latin word cogitatio, thought, implies a research, for cogitare, to think, seems to be equivalent to coagitare, that is, to discuss together. Now Damascene says in his On the True Faith for that faith is an assent without research. Therefore, thinking has no place in the act of faith. Objection to. Further, faith resides in the reason, as we shall show further on, in question 4, article 2. Now to think is an act of the cogitative power, which belongs to the sensitive faculty as stated in the first part, question 78, article 4. Therefore, Thought has nothing to do with faith. Objection 3. Further, to believe is an act of the intellect, since its object is truth. But assent seems to be an act not of the intellect, but of the will, even as consent is, as stated above. Pars prima secunde, question 15, article 1, third reply. Therefore, to believe is not to think with assent. On the contrary, this is how to believe is defined by Augustine in his On the Predestination of the Saints too. I answer that to think can be taken in three ways. First, in a general way for any kind of actual consideration of the intellect, as Augustine observes in On the Trinity, 14.7. By understanding, I mean now the faculty whereby we understand when thinking. Secondly, to think is more strictly taken for that consideration of the intellect, which is accompanied by some kind of inquiry, and which precedes the intellect's arrival at the state of perfection that comes with the certitude of sight. In this sense, Augustine says in On the Trinity 15.16 that 
the son of god is not called the thought but the word of god when our thought realizes what we know and takes form therefrom it becomes our word hence the word of god must be understood without any thinking on the part of god for there is nothing there that can take form or be unformed in this way thought is properly speaking the movement of the mind while yet deliberating and not yet perfected by the clear sight of truth since however such a movement of the mind may be one of deliberation either about universal notions which belongs to the intellectual faculty or about particular matters which belongs to the sensitive part hence it is that to think is taken secondly for an act of the deliberating intellect and thirdly for an act of the cogitative power accordingly if to think be understood broadly according to the first sense then to think with assent does not express completely what is meant by to believe since in this way a man thinks with assent even when he considers what he knows by science translators note science is certain knowledge of a demonstrated conclusion through its demonstration or understands if on the other hand to think be understood in the second way then this expresses completely the nature of the act of believing for among the acts belonging to the intellect some have a firm assent without any such kind of thinking as when a man considers the things that he knows by science or understands for this consideration is already formed but some acts of the intellect have unformed thought devoid of a firm assent whether they incline to neither side as in one who doubts or incline to one side rather than the other but on account of some slight motive as in one who suspects or to incline to one side yet with fear of the other as in one who opines but this act to believe cleaves firmly to one side in which respect belief has something in common with science and understanding yet its knowledge does not attain the perfection of clear sight wherein it agrees with doubt suspicion and opinion hence it is proper to the believer to think with assent so that the act of believing is distinguished from all the other acts of the intellect which are about the true or the false reply to objection one faith has not that research of natural reason which demonstrates what is believed but a research into those things whereby a man is induced to believe for instance that such things have been uttered by god and confirmed by miracles reply to objection two to think is not taken here for the act of the cogitative power but for an act of the intellect as explained above reply to objection three the intellect of the believer is determined to one object not by the reason but by the will wherefore assent is taken here for an act of the intellect as determined to one object by the will second article whether the act of faith is suitably distinguished as believing god believing in a god and believing in god objection one it would seem that the act of faith is unsuitably distinguished as believing god believing in a god and believing in god for one habit has but one act now faith is one habit since it is one virtue therefore it is unreasonable to say that there are three acts of faith objection to further 
that which is common to all acts of faith should not be reckoned as a particular kind of act of faith now to believe god is common to all acts of faith since faith is founded on the first truth therefore it seems unreasonable to distinguish it from certain other acts of faith objection three further that which can be said of unbelievers cannot be called an act of faith now unbelievers can be said to believe in a god therefore it should not be reckoned an act of faith objection four further movement towards the end belongs to the will whose object is the good and the end now to believe is an act not of the will but of the intellect therefore to believe in god which implies movement towards an end should not be reckoned as a species of that act on the contrary is the authority of augustine who makes this distinction in his homily sixty one tract twenty nine on john on the word of the lord i answer that the act of any power or habit depends on the relation of that power or habit to its object now the object of faith can be considered in three ways for since to believe is an act of the intellect in so far as the will moves it to assent as stated above in article one third reply the object of faith can be considered either on the part of the intellect or on the part of the will that moves the intellect if it be considered on the part of the intellect then two things can be observed in the object of faith as stated above question one article one one of these is the material object of faith and in this way an act of faith is to believe in a god because as stated above nothing is proposed to our belief except in as much as it is referred to god the other is the formal aspect of the object for it is the medium on account of which we assent to such and such a point of faith and thus an act of faith is to believe god since as stated above the formal object of faith is the first truth to which man gives his adhesion so as to assent for its sake to whatever he believes thirdly if the object of faith be considered in so far as the intellect is moved by the will an act of faith is to believe in god for the first truth is referred to the will through having the aspect of an end reply to objection one these three do not denote different acts of faith but one and the same act having different relations to the object of faith this suffices for the reply to the second objection reply to objection three unbelievers cannot be said to believe in a god as we understand it in relation to the act of faith for they do not believe that god exists under the conditions that faith determines hence they do not truly imply belief in a god since as the philosopher observes in metaphysics nine to know simple things defectively is not to know them at all reply to objection four as stated above in pars prima secundae question nine article one the will moves the intellect and the other powers of the soul to the end and in this respect an act of faith is to believe in god third article whether it is necessary for salvation to believe anything above the natural reason objection one it would seem unnecessary for salvation to believe anything above the natural reason for the salvation and perfection of a thing seem to be sufficiently insured by its natural endowments now matters of faith surpass man's natural reason 
since they are things unseen, as stated above. Question 1, Article 4. Therefore, to believe seems unnecessary for salvation. Objection 2. Further, it is dangerous for man to assent to matters wherein he cannot judge whether that which is proposed to him be true or false, according to Job 12.11. Doth not the ear discern words? Now a man cannot form a judgment of this kind in matters of faith, since he cannot trace them back to first principles, by which all our judgments are guided. Therefore it is dangerous to believe in such matters. Therefore, to believe is not necessary for salvation. Objection 3. Further, man's salvation rests on God, according to Psalm 36.39. But the salvation of the just is from the Lord. Now, the invisible things of God are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made his eternal power also and divinity according to romans one twenty and those things which are clearly seen by the understanding are not an object of belief therefore it is not necessary for man's salvation that he should believe certain things on the contrary it is written in hebrews eleven six Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I answer that, wherever one nature is subordinate to another, we find that two things concur towards the perfection of the lower nature, one of which is in respect of that nature's proper movement, while the other is in respect of the movement of the higher nature. Thus water, by its proper movement, moves towards the center of the earth, while according to the movement of the moon, it moves round the center by ebb and flow. In like manner, the planets have their proper movements from west to east, while in accordance with the movement of the first heaven, they have a movement from east to west. Now the created rational nature alone is immediately subordinate to God, since other creatures do not attain to the universal, but only to something particular while they partake of the divine goodness either in being only, as inanimate things, or also in living, and in knowing singulars, as plants and animals. Whereas the rational nature, inasmuch as it apprehends the universal notion of good and beings, is immediately related to the universal principle of being. Consequently, the perfection of the rational creature consists not only in what belongs to it in respect of its nature, but also in that which it acquires through a supernatural participation of divine goodness. Hence it was said above, in Pars Prima Secundae, Question 3, Article 8, that man's ultimate happiness consists in a supernatural vision of God, to which vision man cannot attain unless he be taught by God, according to John 6.45. Every one that hath heard of the Father, and hath learned, cometh to me. Now man acquires a share of this learning, not indeed all at once, but little by little, according to the mode of his nature. And every one who learns thus must needs believe, in order that he may acquire science in a perfect degree. Thus also the philosopher remarks, in his Sophistical Refutations, 1-2, that it behooves a learner to believe. Hence, in order that a man arrive at the perfect vision of heavenly happiness, he must first of all believe God, as a disciple believes the Master who is teaching him. Reply to Objection 1. Since man's nature is dependent on a higher nature, natural knowledge does not suffice for its perfection, and some supernatural knowledge is necessary, as stated above. Reply to Objection 2. Just as man assents to first principles, 
by the natural light of his intellect, so does a virtuous man, by habit of virtue, judge aright of things concerning that virtue. And in this way, by the light of faith which God bestows on him, a man assents to matters of faith and not to those which are against faith. Consequently, there is no danger or condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, and whom he has enlightened by faith. Reply to Objection 3. In many respects, faith perceives the invisible things of God in a higher way than natural reason does, in proceeding to God from his creatures. Hence it is written, in Ecclesiasticus 3.25, Many things are shown to thee above the understandings of man. Fourth article. Whether it is necessary to believe those things which can be proved by natural reason. Objection 1. It would seem unnecessary to believe those things which can be proved by natural reason. For nothing is superfluous in God's works much less even than in the works of nature. Now it is superfluous to employ other means where one already suffices. Therefore, it would be superfluous to receive by faith things that can be known by natural reason. Objection 2. Further, those things must be believed which are the object of faith. Now science and faith are not about the same object, as stated above. Question 1, Articles 4 and 5. Since, therefore, all things that can be known by natural reason are an object of science, it seems that there is no need to believe what can be proved by natural reason. Objection 3. Further, all things knowable scientifically, translator's note, Science is certain knowledge of a demonstrated conclusion through its demonstration. Would seem to come under one head, so that if some of them are proposed to man as objects of faith, in like manner the others should also be believed. But this is not true. Therefore, it is not necessary to believe those things which can be proved by natural reason. On the contrary, it is necessary to believe that God is one and incorporeal, which things philosophers prove by natural reason. I answer that, it is necessary for man to accept by faith not only things which are above reason, but also those which can be known by reason, and this for three motives. First, in order that man may arrive more quickly at the knowledge of divine truth. Because the science, to whose province it belongs to prove the existence of God, is the last of all to offer itself to human research, since it presupposes many other sciences, so that it would not by until late in life that a man would arrive at the knowledge of God. The second reason is, in order that the knowledge of God may be more general. For many are unable to make progress in the study of science, either through dullness of mind, or through having a number of occupations, and temporal needs, or even through laziness and learning, all of whom would be altogether deprived of the knowledge of God, unless divine things were brought to their knowledge under the guise of faith. The third reason is for the sake of certitude, for human reason is very deficient in things concerning God. A sign of this is that philosophers in their researches, by natural investigation into human affairs, have fallen into many errors and have disagreed among themselves. And consequently, in order that men might have knowledge of God, free of doubt and uncertainty, it was necessary for divine matters to be delivered to them by way of faith, being told to them, as it were, by God himself who cannot lie. Reply to Objection 1 
the researches of natural reason do not suffice mankind for the knowledge of divine matters even of those that can be proved by reason and so it is not superfluous if these others be believed reply to objection to science and faith cannot be in the same subject and about the same object but what is an object of science for one can be an object of faith for another as stated above in question one article five reply to objection three although all things that can be known by science are of one common scientific aspect they do not all alike lead man to beatitude hence they are not all equally proposed to our belief fifth article whether man is bound to believe anything explicitly objection one it would seem that man is not bound to believe anything explicitly for no man is bound to do what is not in his power now it is not in man's power to believe a thing explicitly for it is written in romans ten fourteen and fifteen how shall they believe of him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach unless they be sent therefore man is not bound to believe anything explicitly objection to further just as we are directed to god by faith so are we by charity now man is not bound to keep the precepts of charity and it is enough if he be ready to fulfill them as is evidenced by the precept of our lord in matthew five thirty nine if one strike thee on one cheek turn to him also the other and by others of the same kind according to augustine's exposition on the lord's sermon on the mount nineteen therefore neither is man bound to believe anything explicitly and it is enough if he be ready to believe whatever god proposes to be believed objection three further the good of faith consists in obedience according to romans one five for obedience to the faith in all nations now the virtue of obedience does not require man to keep certain fixed precepts but it is enough that his mind be ready to obey according to psalm one hundred and eighteen sixty i am ready and am not troubled that i may keep thy commandments therefore it seems enough for faith too that man should be ready to believe whatever god may propose without his believing anything explicitly on the contrary it is written in hebrews eleven six he that cometh to god must believe that he is and is a rewarder to them that seek him i answer that the precepts of the law which man is bound to fulfill concern acts of virtue which are the means of attaining salvation now an act of virtue as stated above in pars prima secundae question sixty article five depends on the relation of the habit to its object again two things may be considered in the object of any virtue namely that which is in the proper and direct object of that virtue and that which is accidental and consequent to the object properly so called thus it belongs properly and directly to the object of fortitude to face the dangers of death and to charge at the foe with danger to oneself for the sake of the common good yet that in a just war a man be armed or strike another with his sword and so forth is reduced to the object of fortitude but indirectly accordingly just as a virtuous act is required for the fulfillment of a precept so is it necessary that the virtuous act should terminate in its proper and direct object but on the other hand the fulfillment of the precept 
does not require that a virtuous act should terminate in those things which have an accidental or secondary relation to the proper and direct object of that virtue, except in certain places and at certain times. We must therefore say that the direct object of faith is that whereby man is made one of the blessed, as stated above. Question 1, Article 8. While the indirect and secondary object comprises all things delivered by God to us in Holy Writ, for instance, that Abraham had two sons, that David was the son of Jesse, and so forth. Therefore, as regards the primary points or articles of faith, man is bound to believe them, just as he is bound to have faith. But as to other points of faith, man is not bound to believe them explicitly, but only implicitly, or to be ready to believe them, in so far as he is prepared to believe whatever is contained in the divine scriptures. Then alone is he bound to believe such things explicitly, when it is clear to him that they are contained in the doctrine of faith. Reply to Objection 1. If we understand those things alone to be in a man's power, which we can do without the help of grace, then we are bound to do many things which we cannot do without the aid of healing grace, such as to love God and our neighbor, and likewise to believe the articles of faith. But with the help of grace we can do this, for this help, to whomsoever it is given from above, it is mercifully given, and from whom it is withheld, it is justly withheld, as a punishment of a previous, or at least of original sin, as Augustine states in On Rebuke and Grace, 5.6. Confer also his letter 190, as well as On the Predestination of the Saints, 8. Reply to Objection 2. Man is bound to love definitely those lovable things which are properly and directly the objects of charity, namely, God and our neighbor. The objection refers to those precepts of charity which belong, as a consequence, to the objects of charity. Reply to Objection 3. The virtue of obedience is seated, properly speaking, in the will. Hence, promptness of the will subject to authority suffices for the act of obedience because it is the proper and direct object of obedience but this or that precept is accidental or consequent to that proper and direct object end of question two part one read by michael shane craig lambert lc